Icewind Dale, Meet the Goblinoid Giant Slayers, by User Consisting Fiction. Yeah, we really don't have a good name for this yet. He asked us, can can you make like a good group name? It's like, well, we killed some giants. <laughs> yeah, giant scars, yeah. So look, guys, uh, this uh, story is actually a game that I am in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Megan's not in this game, sadly, because it's I on. I work in, Saturdays. Yeah, Mag- Megan's in work at the time that the game's played on. But uh, it's actually very interesting. Hopefully this might turn into a big, long multi-parter. Mm-hmm. But we'll just see how this goes. You know, I'm really looking forward to, to actually be in one of these stories yeah. for once. And I won't I won't spoil. I won't, no. I'll, I'll try to shut up. But that's it for me. <laughs> Let's just get into this. Through a contrived series of events I won't recount, I wound up on a 5th edition Spelljammer server, which also happened to be the stomping grounds of a certain green text YouTuber, and wound up running an Icewind Deal campaign there. This is the ongoing story of a band of savage cannibals trying to be heroes, and a GM trying to make sense of it all. Yeah, I feel bad for. <laughs> I feel Fuck bad off, for Nick Booty. <laughs> <laughs> like, you just have to put it in, you know. Chapter one and two: Meet the Goblinoid Giant Slayers. Be me, GM, relatively new to fifth edition, first time running Wizards of the Coast module. Be not me, Evar the Human Wizard. A creepy Rasputin-looking motherfucker. I really enjoy him. He's a lot of fun. Which is James, by the way. Elton John, the Goblin Celestial Warlock. Fabulous. Mittens. Neddy El Yeti, the Bugbear Druid. An albino raised by Yetis. And a Frost Maiden worshipper. He's normally our usual DM. DM, yeah. Orc, the half-orc barbarian. You already know him. He was the DM. Jonathan was the DM for the previous story that... uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Stugok, bugbear rogue, enjoys moonlit walks in the beach and stabbing. <laughs> yeah, well, what game's complete if it doesn't have a Spanish fellow with absolutely terrible audio? <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's, it's not quite complete without one of them, at least. The server we're on already has a huge fetish for monster races. Yeah, well, look, there is a lot of orcs and yeah. lizards and whatnot. I think I'm the only... Well, you're the only dwarf. No, there's, two, there's, there's three, two, no, there's three, three dwarves. dwarves die. Yeah. I'm the only goblin. And there's one elf, and then everyone else. This is orcs. Or, yeah, pretty yeah. much orcs, yeah. This campaign is not going to be normal, is it? No. The region of Icewind Dale has been under a spell of winter and endless night for the last two years. The cold saps the vitality from the land and its people, and the goddess of winter's fury, Arul, the Frost Maiden, seems to be responsible. Icewind Dale is heavy with suffering and calls out for heroes. What Icewind Dale gets is this party. Sans the Goblin Warlock. They arrive in Icewind Dale by sled, cutting through the mountains. Some are Dale natives coming home. Others are foreigners visiting for the first time, with blizzards and constant minus 50 degree cold battering the whole region. There aren't many coming or going anymore. The party is accompanied by a wizard, Dazan, and his bodyguard. Dazan says he's investigating the deal and the source of the endless winter, and offers the party a quick job. There's a type of fairy called Twinga found in the deal, which might have something to do with the winter. He offers them some quick cash and a tracking lamp to get the job done. I fucking five gold. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Neddy then takes a handful of the coins offered up front and throws them into a snowdrift. <laughs> like it's, you, you'll, you'll find out more, Megan. You'll find out more. An offering for the lady. <laughs> so that's how it's going to be. They spot a tinker's sled in the distance, and stop to buy some supplies. They find the tinker and his sled dogs dead, being fed on by malnourished wolves. So what do you do? Everybody rolls initiative immediately. Huh? Stugok and Orc slaughter the wolves quickly, taking little damage, and the last runs off into the snow. But they find that the wolves didn't kill the tinker or the dogs. All the feeding was post-mortem. You killed dogs. For scavenging. No, they weren't dogs, they were wolves, and they attacked us, by the way. Okay. They, they came gunning at us, alright? The party also skins and harvests both of the dogs and the wolves for meat. Look, it's a frozen barn wasteland, waste not, what not. Nothing goes to waste. They debate eating the tinker too. <laughs> but decide against it. Like, oh my I, that's, god. That, like, that's teal. I, I managed to convince them, <laughs> like, no, we should really bring the body into town, you know, get them examined, you know. Every single body had a deep, clean stab wound in the chest or head, including all the dogs. There were tracks around the sled, one set belonging to a booted humanoid, and giant gaps in the tracks, as if the killer had jumped 30 feet. They found a letter on the tinker which identified him as Jericho. 
They start taking the sled for themselves and loot the supplies. Their driver notes that the tinker was heading south to the mountains, but there's nowhere near enough supplies to make the journey. Ivar loses his oil familiar, commanding it to follow the tracks back to their source, while the party continues on the last leg of the journey to Bryn Shander. There are ten towns in Icewind Dale, and Bryn Shander is the biggest one left. Ivar's oil is waiting for the party atop the wall. The killer's tracks came from and returned here. Inside the city, they meet with a sheriff, letting him know about the dead tinker. He tells them this is the fourth murder like this in the last few months, the second in his city. There is a bounty on the killer's head, which the party takes on. Meanwhile, the party learns that the city is performing human sacrifice. Every new moon they hold a lottery, and the winner is thrown into the snow to die as a sacrifice to the Frost Maiden. Nettie, being a devout follower of the Winter Lady, puts the names of every party member into the lottery. Oh, God. <laughs> thanks, the, y'all. The clerk thanks him for being so early. The last lottery was just a few days ago. Nettie goes into the main square, gets on a soapbox, and starts preaching to the town about the Frost Maiden and her virtues. It's dark and 50 below, so the only people out are the merchants selling supplies. The party is approached by a man with bright blue eyes. He asks them, how much for the body? He's a caravan guard called Sefik, who often buys bounties of hunters to transport them to their destination. The party lets him know that the tinker's body isn't for sale, and he leaves, but not before giving Nettie a hand signal, showing that he is also a Frost Maiden worshipper. They take the body to the local temple, the House of the Morning Lord. Inside, they hear a high-pitched voice yell, No, he isn't! It's, it's a gnome. It's a gnome. <laughs> no, he isn't. Get Lathander's name out of your stinking human mouth. <laughs> oh, God. They knock and the commotion stops, and they're greeted by a human woman and a gnome. The party gathers that these two worship different gods, both called the Morning Lord, and there's a little bit of a religious tension. The one Irish player. <laughs> Aye, I know a thing or two. I know a thing or two about that. <laughs> Kinky but stop. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out the gnome knew the tinker and is distraught at his death. The party learns that Jericho was panicked about last month's lottery, but got over it by the drawing day. He was seen bolting out of town on his sled the night before, and nobody knew why. They lay the body to rest and see that there's also a trio of frostbitten dwarves recovering by the fire. One reaches over to them and asks them to send a message to the local blacksmith. Their iron shipment was caught in a blizzard and their friend got killed by a yeti and got left in the middle of the tundra. The party knows the quest hook when they hear one and head over to the blacksmith, gets directions and decide to sleep the night before going on a quest. They're directed to the North Look Inn, a rough and tumble adventuring spot. As they approach, they hear people chanting, poke the fish, poke the fish, louder and louder, until they look through the window and see a young soldier poke a huge stuffed trout on the wall. Then the trout moves and bites his finger. Blood spurts everywhere. The whole place laughs and drinks get passed around. The party gets some rooms and a quick meal, plus picking up some local rumours. They hear about the local blacksmith's troubles, about goblins building a fortress in the mountains under their new leader, and about the town of Dugan's Hole, a backwater under attack by giant wolves. The next morning, the party head out of town on their sled. They can't afford sled dogs, so Orc and the bugbear take turns. It takes two days of exhausting travel through the tundra, including pushing on through a nasty blizzard, but they find the site of the yeti attack. The dwarven igloo has fallen down. The dead dwarf's body is there, and his legs are there, and his arms are way over there, and his head's missing. Textbook yeti attack. Only problem is, the iron shipment is gone. The snowfall is fresh and there are tracks, the sled itself, and a bunch of tiny snowshoe prints. I will point out this was the third point in the session, and I had to, like, you know, turn around to everyone and be like, look, guys, these uh, dwarves are not for eating. Like, you can't be eating them. <laughs> uh, we're going to bring the bodies back, okay? Um, playing with a bunch of fucking cannibals. <laughs> like, like, you know, look, I'm playing with bug bugbergs and, you know what yeah. I mean, orcs, and you know what I mean. You, uh, look, I'm the only human, for God's sake. <laughs> the party follows and sees the sled being pushed along by a pack of goblins. They sneak around to the sides and launch an ambush, killing a few and cowing the remaining pair into submission. Yeah, we t-post them. Did you? <laughs> yeah, we t-post them into submission. No, we didn't actually. 
but uh, yeah, we did we did we do still have them hostage and i don't know if teal butchered them for meat yet i actually oh. don't know what he did with them they ask where they're taking the shipment and they nervously point just at the edge of their vision there's a two-story goblin war sled pulled by a pair of malnourished polar bears the party approaches and distracts the polar bears with dog meat they draw out the goblin boss and Avar nails her with a magic missile, but she survives. She grabs a torch and threatens to blow up the entire wagon. I'll throw down with the Humi. I don't give a fuck. The party bursts in, jumps to the top story and shoves the boss out onto the snow. Then they see the boss use a potion and speak to one of the polar bears, which starts roaring and going at the party. They knock the boss out and calm the bears down with more meat. Interrogating the goblins, they plead for mercy in the name of Yarb Gnop. The party knows enough about goblins between them to know it means the Ever Gnawing and must be the name of their new chief. They journey back to Bryn Shander, avoiding another blizzard. They wanted to take the bears with them at first, but they realised just how much it would cost to feed them and how poor they were. <laughs> yeah, it was seven gold a day to feed polar bears oh God. each. So um, they got butchered for me. Of course they did. Nettie stays at Bryn Shander for a while building an ice fort outside of the town walls to keep the goblins imprisoned. And the party is joined by Elton John, the goblin warlock, who apparently does not mind the slaughter and enslavement of his people. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't think much for it. Hey guys, do you like models in your tabletop role-playing games? Because we do too. Do you like having big bitty waifus on your table? Because we do too. <laughs> <laughs> we got human bitties, we got lizard bitties, Bitties, we got orc bitties, oni bitties, cat bussies. We've got everything you want at neckbeardia.co.uk. <laughs> Check the links down below. It helps us out a lot. Sorry for interrupting the video. Let's get on the story. They get a message from the wizard, Dazan, telling them that he's headed up with a caravan to the town of Bremen, where they can find him once they've captured a Twinga. They decide to journey to Duggan's Hole, where they hope that killing some big wolves will net them some money. The road to Duggan's Hole is interrupted by the town of Goodmead. On the road, the party encounters a trapper, who warns them that Goodmead was just attacked by a giant, who slew their town speaker and stole several casks of mead. The hunter offers to sell the party an arctic fox he just caught, which is oddly docile for a wild animal. Avar is immediately entranced and keeps it as a pet. Look, he seemed really adorable. Too. He seemed really nice. I would too. He, he seemed like a very sweet little fox. And I couldn't say no. And it was only two gold. Oh, two gold. Two yeah, gold. Well, you like, know, I'm, I'm okay with that. They ask where he caught the fox. And the trapper points to a corpse of trees. They investigate and find a little den with little clothes woven from sticks and pine needles. As if made for a doll. Their tracking lamp starts to glow a bit. I was trying to dress up Elton John and them crews, but he's a bit too <laughs> big for them. <laughs> they pull into Dugan's Hole and find that half the town is at the shrine, honouring the dead speaker. They get the full story from the mourners, and then from the women leading the eulogy. A cast maker named Olivessa. Mead is the town's lifeblood, and the trade is suspended until they can recover the casks and ensure they won't be attacked by more giants. The party volunteers to back up a group of militiamen who already left in exchange for free food and lodgings. They follow the tracks until they find the militiamen are all crushed into a fine red paste in the snow. The tracks led further into the forest, clearly those of an ogre. That's when their lamp begins to glow, and Avar narrowly dodges a snowball aimed at his head. They see the Chewinga, a doll-sized person in a coat, woven from pine needles dancing all about. The fox runs up to it, and the Chewinga jumps on its back and starts riding it around like a horse. He was very adorable. So, he, was, he was very nice wee things. He <laughs> the party finds this all extremely cute and tries to communicate with the fairy. It can't speak, but it whistles and chirps and mimes, and it tells them that the giant is in love. The party gathers that this is why the giant wanted mead, and wonders what the wisdom save for saying ogre sex would be. Well, look, let's be serious. Fucking like, you know, like, like, the ogre, he, like, he, he wants to have himself a nice wee dinner date with his. Or couple of glasses like, you know, of wine. Yeah, you know, he, you know. he wants to get the good mead in. Like, you know, <laughs> like, I, I can't blame the fellow for trying, you know? The party arrives at the giant's lair, a cave complex. And I did actually try to roll to see, like, like, can I smell any sex in the air? Can, I, I, can you smell, <laughs> the, 
<laughs> Can you smell that filthy ogre sex in the Are air? you just here in the distance? Oh, yeah, like, All night long. <laughs> <laughs> I like to imagine it's just Marvin Gaye playing in the background. <laughs> yeah. The party arrive at the giant's lair, a cave complex, and the rogue scouts inside. He sees a pen filled with livestock by fire, hears snoring from one direction, and whistling and sharpening of a weapon from the other. He finds the ogre sleeping soundly, with the mead casks nearby, one already empty. Stugok calls the party in and they execute it. Yeah, it was like, you know, the ring, the similar to the rings mm -hmm. in Brie. <laughs> That's pretty much what we did. They sneak around the side and find a bear sleeping in another cave. They execute it too. Bugbear rogues are broken. Yeah, because they get that sneak attack yeah. and it all oh, multiplies as well. It's, it's like it is broken. See at low levels it is. It's very potent. They find that the source of the whistling is another giant, a Verbig. This is the one which killed the speaker and stole the mead. Be honest with you, I didn't even know that. We <laughs> just we just, look, we just look, we just killed everyone, alright? <laughs> they ambush him too, but don't get as lucky. They still manage to kill him without taking much damage. As the party is looking over the loot, especially the livestock they can sell for good cash, they hear a voice outside. Dog, I'm here! <laughs> the Verbig's lady love, Gag, <laughs> has arrived. The party does their best to hide, except for Avar. He just stands in the shit-filled livestock pen trying to calm the animals. <laughs> I did try. Like, I go to, like, it was something like a minus one on stealth, okay? <laughs> Gag comes in and gets nervous that neither Doug, nor the ogre, nor the bear have shown up. Avar does a bit, trying to convince her that he's a travelling manure salesman looking to buy from Doug. <laughs> He doesn't get very far. I think I would have got a lot further, if I'm being honest <laughs> with you, because that was high quality shit that they had in that pen, all right? Oh, and then, they, see them farmers to the south? They would have bought that shit. You know, you're sitting on a gold mine here, <laughs> absolute feces. <laughs> Stugok makes his move in the party attacks, but she's the toughest opponent they've faced thus far. Orc takes a solid beating. Elton John is healing. And Avar tries to distract her by telling her that Elton John is her baby. No, that was Elton John that wanted to be a Gugu Gaka. Oh, mommy. No, that, was, that was Elton's idea. That was not my idea, okay? <laughs> Doug and I aren't ready for kids. <laughs> the battle turned in the party's favour, so she took a deep breath and exhaled a fog cloud which allowed her to escape. Stugok came to the rescue again, dashing through the cloud and jumping on the giantess's back killing her with a strike to the neck. Who plays Jugo? Um, the Spanish fellow that with horrible audio. So you can't audio. hear a thing that he's going to do and he <laughs> yeah. just runs <laughs> Yeah, like, like, it's, like, it's like... Kill. It's like that all the time. Party. Go see your husband in hell. He was just a friend. <laughs> Dies. <laughs> friend zoned in death. That's kind of sad. Sad. Big sad. Do you reckon that? I think that's why that other one was like sharpening his knife and stuff and he was legion because he wasn't getting like he wasn't he got, getting like, his dick wet. No, he wasn't. No. I think that's why. I, I'm still convinced that's the reason why they got the eel. I just want, I think he just wanted a better, like, you know, a nice wee dinner date. And that's <laughs> yeah. why I actually do think that. Gag had been carrying a basket filled with strange metal shards, twisted and torn but smooth and already forged. When the party touched them, they had strange visions. Nodloids burning through the phlogiston, beams glittering betwixt the stars. Then as soon as the visions came, they left. Outside the cave, the party was attacked again by the Choinga, intimidating how Stugok slew Gag. <laughs> With a little more playing and miming, it seemed content to follow the party and give them a gift, a charm of animal conjuring. Really handy we think that. See, for level two, that's broken. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's really good for level two. Yeah. The party returned to Goodmead, returned the casks, sold off the livestock and the heads of all their slain foes, and were feted all night long. They took the nickname Giant Slayers. The town was looking for a new speaker, and Lavessa was one of the front runners, though she didn't really want the position. She hinted that a party member might run, but everyone quickly decided that was a terrible idea. Not enthused by the idea that the position might be taken by someone who didn't really want it, the party asks who the other candidate is. They get pointed to a dwarven logger dancing on top of a table. Elton John goes over and strikes up a conversation with the dwarf, Shander Froth, and see that he's quite well liked with the other loggers and is very enthusiastic. Elton John makes nice with Froth and they come to a little quid pro quo understanding. Elton John convinces the rest of the party to endorse Froth, 
They stay an extra night to see the election in the morning, and when Froth is elected, they spend another night drinking and celebrating. After getting over their hangovers, the party plans to head to Dugan's Hole and take on the wolves, but that's a story for another day. So what do you boys think? This is the first time we've done, well, this is going to be the first time we're going to be doing a big long multi-part story on something that we're actually in, which is kind of, I actually, I actually really enjoy yeah. this. Like we have had one-off stories that Garbo's gotten for us and we've had ones that have been in the same game that we play in. Yeah. But they're never quite the same. And this one, we do want it to be the entire uh, Icewind Deal campaign yeah. book. Yeah. Um, we're not going to do it beat for beat though, we're going to chop it up and only put in bits that, uh, only sessions that make for good storytelling. Yeah, exactly, you know? so it's not going to be like a consecutive story, but you'll yeah. get it, like you'll, you'll it'll run the, from one story to the next. Yeah, you'll, you'll get the gist of what's going on yeah. though. Um, but look, let us know what you thought about this because I really enjoyed it and I really want this to be a thing. But if you guys aren't in it or aren't feeling it, you know, let us know. Let, let us, us know, know down below if it, you like it or... Like, you Whatever, know, just let just, us know. Just let us know. You know what I mean? That's always cool. Yeah, and while you're here, check out all the links, check out the models on the website, hit subscribe and hit that notification bell so you get notified every time we post. Anything um, else? No. No, I think that's it. Anyway, look, guys, hope you enjoyed this one. We'll see you later. Bye.